Welcome to the United Leukodystrophy Foundation's newly diagnosed pediatric panel. Today's panelists are Ron Chaplow, Alan Fingerroot, and Dr. Joshua Bunkowski. We're going to start with having Doc, uh, with Ron Chaplow giving an introduction about himself. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Ron Chaplow. Thank you, Keely. Uh, I live in Ontario, Canada. I'm a vice president with the ULF. Uh, I have a family of five. I've got my wife, Marla, here to my, uh, my left. An oldest daughter, Alexander, 23, who's currently studying neuroscience at uh, the Go University, doing a master's under Dr. Bernard. I have my affected son, who has MLC1, uh, Aiden Chapel, he's 22, and my youngest, Liam, is 19, uh, also at university. Been affiliated with the ULF for just over 20 years now, been the vice president for five or six years. Uh, Aiden was diagnosed, and we can go into that a little later on, just uh, about the age of two just slightly past the age of two, although we'd had reasons for concern for a good year before that. Uh, Alan, you want to take it from there? And I've been with ULF since so about 1987. I had a son with Canavan's disease. And of course, at that time, nobody knew anything about, about Canavan's and other than it was a leukodystrophy. And he was diagnosed Basically, he could have had three different leukodystrophies, but cannabis was the most likely. Uh, we discovered in 1987 the ULF and uh, that they were doing research into his disease, and we were able to finally get a confirm a firm confirmed diagnosis. Uh, that time, the book said he'd live two to three years. Uh, my son lived to a ripe old age of 15, though he was completely, uh, he was totally dependent on external intervention. He couldn't do anything for himself. And we learned at that time that we had to be our own advocates for our son because being a new disease, nobody really knew much about it. And we were learning as, as we were going along. Uh, his, he had absolutely no muscle tone and we took care of him for several years before we were finally able to get some outside help to give us a break. Uh, but uh, anyway, I've been on the, I am the actual treasurer of the board of director on the board of directors and uh, it, the ULF has been doing great things. So I will pass pass it on. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Josh Bonkowski. I'm a pediatric neurologist at the University of Utah. That's in Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, we have a children's hospital here called Primary Children's Hospital, where we see all our um, pediatric patients. It's the only children's hospital for a large area. It's about 400,000 square miles where we are responsible for. So that's about the size of France plus Germany combined. I was looking this up the other day. Uh, even though it's not a very uh, geographically population dense area, it's still a lot of kids in this region, about 1.4 million children. And uh, so we get a lot of referrals from all over the place, Utah, Montana, Wyoming, um, Idaho, uh, parts of Nevada and Colorado and Arizona come up here. Um, I have uh, um, four kids myself, and um, the oldest ones are trying to send to college this fall if college is open. Um, and I started working the first patients. I remember knowing having leukodystrophy is back in 2000. And um, since then, it's become a more and more major part of kind of how I spend my clinical time and uh, research time as well. So it's, it's great to be here and, and meeting folks. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your uh, introductions. I'm going to give you guys a couple of questions. Anybody that's watching in the audience, please feel free to use the chat feature on YouTube to submit any of your questions and I'll pass them along to our panelists. So to start, I was thinking I could ask uh, Dr. Bonkowski. Um, for any newly diagnosed patient or the parents of the di new newly diagnosed patient, um, what are some things that they can do to make sure that their care team has all of the information that they need uh, in terms of getting the best results for disease management? 
Uh, that's a great question. Um, I had kind of a general piece of advice, then more specific piece of advice. The general um, piece of advice is to um, make a folder, either a digital folder or a paper folder, and just carry everything with you uh, because um, there's so many incompatibilities between all these different medical record systems that um, information gets lost in transit or lost in uh, medical records. Um, whereas if you have the information yourself, then it's in your hands and you can kind of control it regardless of where you're needing to get your care. Um, so that's kind of a general thing. It's kind of a stupid piece of advice, but I, I think um, you're your own child's best advocate for everything. Um, I guess the specific piece, I guess the more specific piece of advice is that um, it's nice to build a team of people that's going to help you. Um, there's no one, I don't think um, any one person can do everything that you need. And over time, you just have to kind of figure out who are the providers or care team members that are going to help you. And so it might be someone like your local pediatrician might be, you know, super helpful or their local pediatrician might be kind of like scared or, you know, confused by this and that might not be the right person. So you have to kind of, unfortunately, uh, trial and error a little bit to see who's going to be helpful and, uh, and who you need to turn to for extra help. Great. Great. All right. So, and then more of a question towards Ron and Alan in terms of how long it took you to get a confirmed diagnosis and, um, what were you doing in the meantime when uh, when you're first getting your diagnosis and thinking it might, you know, getting in between getting a, a, a temporary diagnosis, if you will, versus a confirmed diagnosis? What kind of things were you doing in between to try to learn about the potential diseases? And um, and if you could repeat, if you have already said it, you know, how long was that road in terms of uh, first seeing symptoms when they started seeing symptoms to when you did get a diagnosis and start to treat? Uh, Ron, if you want to start and then we'll pass to Alan. Sure. So our first symptom, as I think it is for, for so many kids with, with leukodystrophies, was an enlarged head. And, and given how common hydrocephalus is in that age bracket, that was the initial Worry, so we went up and did uh, an ultrasound of the head, uh, came back normal, uh, so didn't pursue it further. And our next, and that would have been at the age of six months. six months. Our next well baby check with our family doctor, who was excellent, once again did the head circumference size, saw it was still growing exponentially. It was now, I think, in the 99th percentile as far as high diameter goes, and said, Hey, I can't ignore this. Aiden's progress as far as abilities were on the low end, but still, you know, not missing all the, the markers. So we weren't particularly concerned either physically or cognitively at that point. Sent him for, uh, at that point, a CAT scan that showed abnormalities with the um, abnormalities uh, with, the, with the brain. At that point, he was uh, booked for an MRI. We waited, I'm going to say, another three months, two to three months for the MRI. Uh, the MRI came back. Uh, and I, that was I'm, at 15 months. At 15 months. And that, I was a health professional, so I got a phone call from the doctor who I had a relationship with. I still remember the day clearly. He called me in the late afternoon, and he goes, um, I've got your MRI back for Aiden. And I said, okay. And at that point, we still weren't super concerned. Aiden was still progressing. He was learning things, uh, both cognitively and physically. And there weren't huge, other than the head size, there weren't huge markers of worry. But he said, I want you to pop in after hours, and I'll see you in the back. And that's sort of when the uh, the heart went thumping and uh, a bit of a cold sweat. So he said, uh, call Marla to come in as well. Have someone look after your kids. So we popped in afterwards. And he sat down with us. Um, and in some ways, it was the worst day of my life. He gave us, I guess, what you call a differential diagnosis, which is, listen, the MRI was brutal. It shows widespread atrophy of the white matter of his brain. Um, we don't know exactly what it is. We think it's a leukodystrophy. And here are the three or four ones we thought they were. And most of them were 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 catastrophic in nature you know uh, you know as many of you know, know to some extent um so i remember just you know we let us out the back door so we didn't have to walk through anybody who was still in the waiting room and we're just you know yeah be, being in absolute dismay and crying and going for a long walk uh uh by ourselves on a local trail just trying to get close ourselves before we came back to see um his uh at that point when he had his uh his sister alive i believe uh yeah um and compose yourself for that. Um, and in some ways, that was the best thing that ever happened to us because 
in many ways, the you know, Aiden has MLC1, which is one of the rare forms of leukodystrophies, but it's also one of the least aggressive ones. Uh, to sort of get that sort of devastating diagnosis and then sort of come back to what Aiden wound up having in many ways was, was a saving grace for us. The period between the MRI and the actual diagnosis was probably about another six to eight months. It was, in fact, the ULF's second opinion program that diagnosed him. So they took Aiden's MRI, his blood work, his CAT scan, uh, physical characteristics, and sent it to a number of doctors, Dr. Vandernap in, um, in Amsterdam, and a bunch in uh, Kennedy Krieger in the States, Dr. Nida, yeah. Um, and they came back with a diagnosis early in his second year of life. Uh, of a disease that Dr. Vanden had just actually basically discovered a few months before, which is originally named after her. Um, in the time between there, yes, we did, I did a ton of reading. Um, it was hard to know because once again, we were dealing with three or four possible disorders uh, with the possibility it could have been none of those because it was, wasn't particularly fitting the pattern for any of them. Um, we did, yeah, we just did a lot of reading. And we've always tried to maintain a reading. I know when I've talked to neurologists or specialists, they've often said, sometimes you need to educate your doctors as best as you're able to. You can't expect them to know everything about every condition, right? They're still treating, you know, if you're a neurologist, you're treating epilepsy. If you're a family doc, you're treating asthma, hypertension, ear infections. So many ways, and I, I found most of my doctors have been really receptive to, to helping them learn about Aiden or, or conditions in general. Uh, so we did a lot of reading, and I, we're by no means experts in it, but I think that was um, that was beneficial. We've always tried to maintain a positive outlook. You know, Aiden's been a Aiden's been an absolute blessing to us, and we've got two other kids to think about. So while we've had definitely have had days where I felt lots of self pity, and I've had days where I felt really angry, I try to forgive myself for having that. I think that's human nature, and generally we try and keep things really positive. We have a good quality of life. I enjoy having Aiden around, and we've been able to. You know, share his life now for 22 years, and it's been great. Alan? Well, my son, Andy, was born in 1983. I had, had I have another son that was born in 1980. So we had an idea of, you know, how the kids should progress as they're, as they're getting older. Well, when Andy was born, he was born in June. And the first thing we noticed was that his head was slightly larger than normal, but the doctor at that point wasn't concerned. As time went on over the next couple of months, uh, we discovered that he just wasn't developing motor skills like he should be. Uh, he wasn't rolling over or turning over or uh, just, he would just lay there. So in December, we took him into Children's Hospital where they ran a series of tests and back then it was a CAT scan, uh, no MRIs. And the CAT scan was somewhat inconclusive at that point. But we continued to monitor his development over the next, over the next year. And he just wasn't developing. He was an extremely happy baby. And it didn't take a lot to make him laugh. But he wasn't developing vocal sounds and he wasn't developing motor skills to where you know he could start to feed himself or lift his arms up to be able to eat something and we searched high and low to try to find information about what the disease might be we had many different tests run and they told us the most accurate would be a brain biopsy but obviously that wasn't something we wanted to do the next closest thing was to remove a piece of his serial nerve in his leg. And we went ahead and had that done. But again, like all the other tests, it was inconclusive. And we kept visiting the neurologist who, in my, while he had no bedside manner, he was extremely intelligent. And he basically said canavans, which at the time was a rare, a rare disorder was the most likely. Uh, it wasn't until 2000, or, I'm sorry, uh, 1987, that we had a story done on Andy and the photographer that was doing the filming went to Children's after, uh, after he spent the day with Andy and met with the genealogist there. And he just happened to see 
a ULF newsletter on the desk. Uh, and it was a story on canavans. At the time, the ULF was one of the leading uh, one of the leading uh, organizations providing funding for research into canavans disease. And make a long story short, they got me in touch with the ULF. And it was too late to go to the conference that year, so we went the following year. Little funny story. We were told to bring a urine specimen with us. And so we got the specimen. We froze it like we were told. And I live in Seattle. The conference was in Chicago. And I was afraid when we got on the plane that it was going to thaw out and it wasn't going to be any good. So without thinking, I asked the flight attendant if they had a freezer where I could stick the specimen in it to keep it frozen. Needless to say, I got a funny look about that, and uh, they brought me more ice. But it turned out that uh, Dr. Ruben Madelon, who was the primary research in cannabis at the time, had determined that there was a mirror image on the spectrum uh, for the cannabis kids, and he went on and was able to diagnose uh, our son with a confirmed diagnosis. And this is this was four years later. Uh, at that point, uh, he was really active into research, and my family was used as a specimen to help provide information for his carrier testing, and we discovered through uh, his testing where in the family the, uh, the gene lies. And it turns out it came from my dad and my late wife's mom. So we were able to map the entire family, I mean, uh, extended family, as to who were carriers and who wasn't. In the meantime, Andy progressed as a normal child size-wise but we went through a lot, of, a lot of issues because these kids aren't normal in the sense that drugs you give them, the normal amount didn't work. And we constantly had to raise the, the amount of medication for spasticity, uh, for him sleeping at night. Uh, we found a method of, uh, for bowel using dark malt uh, and as as time went on we learned more and more about him and his needs uh, he tended to have ear infections and when he'd get an ear infection he would spike a fever and become dehydrated and we'd have to take him into the hospital and go through the whole story with him that's where you become an advocate in telling these doctors, look, we've lived with our child for X number of years. We know exactly what he needs. And look in your records because we've been here many times. Uh, we put off putting a G-tube in, which I would strongly recommend not waiting seven years to do it because it would take us an hour to feed him. And we never thought that we got enough food into him. Uh, but once we did that, he was a lot, ha a lot happier kid and very expressive, uh, with facial movements. He knew who was who, and there was no discipline in the house because every time we'd yell at his brother, he'd start laughing. Uh, at age 13, we had to make the big decision to have him go through surgery to have rods put in his back because he had really bad scoliosis. But he came through that just fine. And uh, unfortunately, at the age of 15, he did, he did leave us. And, uh, you know, everybody that met him instantly fell in love with him. But biggest thing is, you got to be your own advocate. And you've got to fight for anything and everything that you need. All right, thank you so much, both Ron and Alan, for those really great answers. 
Uh, Dr. Bankowski, this one is for you. Uh, are there any other areas of the hospital where families can find support in terms of social workers or if they uh, if they need more emotional support, mental support, um, you know, other areas of support besides just the basic care um, in terms of the health of the patient? Yeah, so um, the resources, resources for families and for patients really vary from um, hospital to hospital and healthcare system to healthcare system. Um, many hospitals now and pediatric centers have um, uh, what are called complex care clinics, uh, which are clinics and physicians who specialize in taking care of kids with two or more complex medical conditions. And a lot of um, children and adults with leukodystrophies have two or more complex medical conditions. And so these groups often have um, kind of integrated clinic visits and also have social workers and other um, kind of ancillary services that are helpful for families. And because it's kind of a one-stop shop, sometimes it's easier. Um, the, some hospitals also have um, what are called palliative care teams, which are teams of physicians and nurses, nurses and um, social workers and chaplains who help families and um, patients, particularly uh, when they're facing um, kind of uh, terminal conditions where a six month to two year time window seems like a possibility and they can provide both direct emotional support and social support as well as planning support so it's not when people are facing kind of these challenges which you know it's not something we deal with it's not something normal right to think about like what happens if someone dies in your house like that's like not a normal situation that most people have to think about but if you have a, a someone in your family with a, with a medical condition suddenly that's like a real question like how do you do that um each hospital is also a little bit different because it's different providers have different um comfort levels with kids with fluke history so at our hospital, it ends up being neurology that has the most kind of expertise and comfort and we have the most services for kids with fluke disease. At other centers, it might be the genetics team or it might be the uh, rehab team. And so um, you have to kind of see who um, has the ability to kind of work with you. A few of the national groups now are realizing that for families, there's of course like the medical and diagnostic parts of the journey for having a leukodystrophy. But then there's everything after that point, like the rest of your life. And um, so organizations like Hunter's Hope have done, um, help provide funding for some centers to have a nurse coordinator who specifically works with leukodystrophy patients and helps you know, figure out how do you get a power wheelchair? How do you get a van that has a, an arm lift to get a wheelchair into it? Um, so kind of services that make your day-to-day -day life uh, more pract practical. All right. Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, we do have um, a question, a little bit of more of a general question from a commenter on the YouTube stream. Um, she says that she's from an island in the Caribbean, the St. Lucia. Her daughter was diagnosed as pediatric by a pediatric neurologist in Martin. Okay, sorry about that. I can't pronounce that. Um, however, to determine the gene type, I was told was very costly. We couldn't afford. Um, so I guess, it, uh, Dr. Bonkowski, maybe are there ways that um, international people might be able to gain access to resources that we have here in the States? And are you aware of any resources that might be able to help pay for those? Yeah, that's uh, an interesting question. So there are some um, research studies, um, which although it's technically research, often gives you a diagnosis. So for example, um, we have a um, testing protocol here for research for diagnosis. I know that Adeline Vandiver's group at CHOP has a program. Each of these programs, um, a little bit of the problem is just getting there to get the testing done. It's not really possible to do it remotely. So that adds a travel cost, um, unfortunately. 
some of the companies now um, are offering testing for some types of disorders uh, for free. So there's a company called Invite, um, which is a genetic testing company that is um, offering free testing for some conditions. So it doesn't test every kind of um, leukodystrophy, but it tests some of them. You, and there's certain age requirements um, to, to be able to be tested. But again, it's kind of an incomplete uh, fashion. So it's a little bit of a, um, there's not a perfect answer, unfortunately, and there's more need right now than um, solutions, I'd say. Okay. One possibility might be social media doing something like a GoFundMe type thing. I mean, that's been used for a thousand different causes, anything from surgeries for pets to 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 things that I would say are more more life altering like this. Um, yeah, I mean that I've seen it be fantastically successful for for a bunch of causes. But yeah, there's all I mean, GoFundMe is that comes to my mind. There's a whole bunch of things on social media or on the internet that might help. That would uh, that you know people from really from around the world can can help um, raise money for it. And I would just, um, that's a good point, Ron. I guess the other thing is that, although it's nothing to sneeze at, um, the cost of testing has come way down. So a cost of a gene panel, which probably has about 80 to 100 genes, is about 1000 to $1,500 out of pocket. And that covers probably 60% of leukodystrophy genes, maybe. And there's also whole exome which is also three to five thousand dollars. Again, nothing to sneeze at, but it's within the realm of like a GoFundMe campaign. All right. Okay. No. Um, okay. So, uh, in terms of next question, um, as we kind of wait for some additional questions to come in through YouTube. Um, to Ron and Alan, we'll start with Alan first and then move to Ron. Um, is there any advice that you can give our newly diagnosed families that if you yourself were back in that, back in their shoes, or what advice would you give them as newly diagnosed parents to a, a pediatric parent, uh, patient rather, um, that you wish that you had back when you were an, a newly diagnosed parent to a patient? <laughs> Well, one thing that I really would have liked to have had was a computer because the computer just opens up a whole world of means of communicating with other parents to, to try out different ideas or to learn new methods of, of how to treat the child or even come up with uh, a means of a diagnosis. Uh, with all the research that's going on through the different leukodystrophies, there's so much on the web. Granted, some of it may not be the best information, but overall, most of it is is right on the money, and it gives you an idea to find out exactly where you're where you stand with your child. If you have a diagnosis, it makes it a whole lot easier because then you you have a network of people out there that you can go to for information to, again, to help you out and provide, provide assistance on what to expect. All right, Ron, do you have anything to add in terms of that question on any advice that you wish you had back when you were part of the newly diagnosed crew? Yeah, probably. I don't know if there's ever one solution that fits all families or all situations. Um, one is a parent. I mean, it's hard to be a parent with with healthy kids. You're always constantly second guessing yourself. And uh, but I would, you know, as I think I said earlier, I would say forgive you. Know, be be forgiving of yourself. You're not going to be perfect, and it's it's really hard in these these situations. You're not always going. You're sort of you're going to error. Sometimes you're going to be angry. As I said, you're going to have moments of self pity, uh, and you have to learn to to not expect perfection and to be forgiving. One thing we haven't done a great job, and I wish we had a, had, was we were offered all kinds of support from families and friends. And we kind of withdrew a bit. It's fair to say and said, hey, we'll deal with this. It's our son. It's our responsibility. But I think generally people are well-meaning and they want to help. I know when I've offered support to others and other in things in life, I, I didn't do it just because I felt a moral obligation to. But I really did want to help. And we didn't take up those offers. And um, 
I think we should have. I think it would have allowed us more time to to be with each other or to, to spend with our other two kids who, who need our time and our attention as well. Um, and I think it actually is good for other people. I think they feel good about themselves. I think as human beings, it's, it's, it's one of the things that, that sort of keeps us going uh, mentally is to, 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 to give to others. So I wish we'd done that. We do have um, the last couple of years we've had care coming into the home a couple of hours each day. Now that was pre COVID that has now since stopped, but and it took us a while to actually allow that to come into our home. So I want, that's one thing I would say is don't delay on things like that. Cause it does give you that couple of hours each day that, I mean, we're up in Canada, so I don't know what it's like in other countries where they do, it's a service that is covered through our uh, government, which is nice. And I played reader Dr. Bonkowski's case, uh, case about building a team. I mean, that's been huge for us. Uh, our doctor's been great, but we've also heavily relied, probably even more on a day-to-day -day basis, on our physical therapists, who've been fantastic, uh, our dietitian, and they do interact with each other. So we sort of connect them with each other. Uh, and so when things come up there, they they sort of collaboratively, collaboratively solve our problems. And that's been uh, that's been huge. You, as much as you read or you know, you can't be a perfect expert in everything, and they've uh, it's been really really helpful in aiding care. And Alan had kind of mentioned something about how he had um, delayed on doing a G2 for his son. And we had as well. And I wish we hadn't. I know our son really was against getting a G2. Once we did get that G2 in, it seemed like he was getting a little more um, energetic and looking a little more alive, yeah. even so. You know, if that's one thing that people are considering at some point down the road, yeah. I wouldn't delay on that. You know, I might also add with what Ron said, though, uh, we too didn't accept help. Uh, you know, nobody knew our kid like we did. We knew what to watch for. But something that you really have to watch out for and, and do yourself is take care of yourself. Because if you get sick, uh, you know, there's nobody to help you and you've got to be there. You've got to be there for your kid. Uh, taking, taking the help when it's offered. And as Marla said, getting out of the house for a couple of hours is just, it's the best medicine that you can ask for. Uh, the other thing is you have to not forget about your, uh, if you have another, another sibling, uh, making sure that you treat them uh, just as much as you are your affected child. And same thing with your spouse. Uh, too many divorces happen when a major situation arises like this. And you have to look out after each other and and support each other with with what's happening. But never turn down help. Uh, regardless of what the situation is, uh, it's it's necessary that you maintain your own your own sanity. Yeah. I would also say that we um, we try and treat Abe like like our other two kids. He has responsibilities. Uh, we do instill discipline on him. I think that's that's been good for him growing up. And um, you know, do we feel bad for him? Yeah, of course we do. Um, but I don't think it does him any good to to pamper him or baby him all the time. Certainly, there are days when we're way more forgiving than other days. But but we, as I said, we um we, we I think to the best of his ability and our ability, we try to treat him like we do his two siblings. And I think that's uh we don't hold the joy. He's he's a nice young man now. He's polite. He's well spoken. I like I like the uh, I like the young adult he's become. All right, wonderful. We did have a question that was emailed in to us. Um, they have a eight-year-old that was diagnosed with Polar 3 back in April, and they were wondering if there's a benefit to seeing a specialist at CHOP or any other more dedicated leukodystrophy center sooner as opposed to later. So um, should they be um, sticking with their local neurologists, their local care teams that are available to them, or should they be pursuing uh, reaching out to CHOP or other specialized leukodystrophy centers sooner? I guess we'll direct that to Dr. Bonkowski first as a physician. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll have one viewpoint, but I'm sure that uh, Ron and Alan can um, chime in also. 
I think there there can be a benefit to seeing a specialist. Um, I think um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a CHOP. It can be at one of the other leukodystrophy sites. Um, just being on a specialist radar, even if there's not a treatment, make sure that when a clinical trial comes along or some sort of opportunity or research study that um, you can be enrolled as quickly as possible. On the other hand, um, families now with the internet and with blogs and uh, Facebook groups often are hearing about stuff before I hear about it. And so um, it's not the dark ages anymore in terms of communication and hearing about stuff. So I think it, um, it depends. Ryan, do you have anything to add? <laughs> yeah, I know when we were talking, Dr. Vandernap, who said was the original earlier today, and the original doctor um, who, uh, who who discovered uh, Aiden's condition, and she was certainly encouraging us to to maintain contact as a group, uh, which you know, depending on how prevalent your condition is, is easier said for some conditions than others. But um, yeah, I don't think it hurts to reach out. I mean, if, if something's discovered. Um, You'd like to be. You'd like to, to find out as, as soon as possible because you know, for a lot of things, you know, a treatment often sort of prevents further decline. But you often don't with any condition, whether it be a leukodystrophy or or heart disease. What's damaged is often damaged permanently. So I, I think there's probably something to be said for reaching out to, if not necessarily traveling overseas to see a specialist, which can be incredibly time consuming, energy consuming, and, and financially draining. Certainly, I think reaching out. I know um, I can't speak for all doctors, but most of the doctors we have dealt with have been incredibly good about, you know, maintaining infrequent contact with emails um, and giving us uh, advice when on the, the occasions that we would need it. They said that most of our concerns, we don't need to reach out to specialists. It's the things you all deal with, you know, a fever, um, what happens. But every once in a while, you have something that's very specific to your leukodystrophy. And I think, I think, yeah, I think establishing a relationship, at least. At least in a, a distant relationship with a doctor who specializes in that condition can't hurt if they're willing to do it. I, I don't see any downside to reaching out. And I know the doctors we've dealt with have always been, we live in a small town in rural Ontario, so we're a long ways away from our specialists. They've always been cognizant of how far we are and very good about doing distance, distance um, help. All right, great. And we do have one more question that's come through. Uh, our daughter is case number one for a new leukodystrophy caused by a LINC RNA called Chaser. What advice do you have? So many unknowns, trying to find another case, but striking out so far, paper coming. And then it says, we're more looking for advice on getting the word out and trying to understand what we're dealing with. Um. I can I could say a few words. Um, so uh, that's both exciting and scary, right? Um, but stuff is moving really quickly with uh, new diagnoses and new cases. So the publication is going to be super helpful because suddenly um, other people, other physicians, other patients will um, show up who didn't know they had that disease, and so that you know happens very quickly. Um, the second thing is there is a um, online, uh, it's almost like a, like a dating app uh, for genetics called a Gene Matcher, um, which your physician or your research team could enter the, um, the gene name and the clinical symptoms into. And then if there's anyone else out there who has the same condition or has the same gene, they'll, they'll be notified and um, it's a way to share information quickly and anonymous, anonymously. And then if both sides agree, they can then de-anonymize and contact each other. But I think, um, you know, things will happen really quickly once the word gets out there about this new condition. So I bet within six months to a year, you'll be getting a lot more information about what's going on. Yeah, that was certainly our experience. Where, as I said, we were going through the MRIs. Aiden's condition had not yet been discovered. Uh, it was shortly into, uh, I guess, this uh, second year of life that it was uh, discovered. And then within months, we'd met a couple of families at the ULF conference that had uh, MLC. It just, sort of, it just sort of happened almost organically. Once that was conditioned, once it was discovered, other doctors and other parents 
looked at you know the you know, the MRI, the, the the presentation of symptoms, and were saying, okay, that seems to fit my child. It didn't quite fit into the other existing boxes like Alexander or Canavans or the other ones at the time. So I think you'll find that that, that will within a year you'll have a number of uh, people around the world, especially now with the internet, uh, around the world who you will be able to connect with and share experiences and what works for you and what doesn't, um, and hopefully discovers as well. Great, thank you so much for those questions and for the answers. YouTubers, if you have any additional questions, please submit them now. Um, otherwise, we will start to wrap up the session for today. I would just like to give a plug for tomorrow's session, uh, which might be helpful for the people that are watching right at this moment. Um, at uh, I'm going to double check my time to make sure that I'm giving you the correct time. But at 4 p.m. Central, we will have a caregivers for pediatric patients, more of a support group. So we're going to talk about things that are less focused on the care of your pediatric patient child uh, and more about you as a caregiver, how to navigate uh, taking care of yourself and uh, working through the dynamics of the family um, while having a patient that is a child that, that is a patient with leukodystrophy. Um, so please join us on tomorrow's session as well. But I also wanted to give a brief shout out to some of the initiatives that the ULF are going to be implementing over the next few months. So starting in August, we will be starting to uh, have educational webinars and hosting support groups through Zoom chat. So we won't be uh, having them broadcast through YouTube. We will have them more through a Zoom chat where you can see each other and talk to one another. Um, but we, we're going to start offering those in August. So please keep an eye out on the ULF website and the ULF Facebook page for more information as we have it. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm not seeing any other questions coming through. So thank you so much to our panelists, Ron Allen and, and Dr. Bonkowski. Thank you for your time and your input. If there are any other, other additional questions, please feel free to email us at office at ulf.org. I'll be happy to pass them along to our panelists and, um, and reply back to you when they have, uh, have given me their answers. So thank you all for your time. Thank you for joining us for our virtual conference. And we hope that we get to see you next year in Chicago. Great. Thanks, Keely. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.